Good morning. Can you hear me? I'll just talk loud. Oh, now you can hear me. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. I hope everyone's doing well this morning. Welcome. A special welcome if you are visiting us for the first time this morning. We are so glad that you're here visiting us at Liberty Baptist Church. Um, welcome. Please fill out before you leave today a visitor's card that you can find in the pew back in front of you so that we know who you are, we know that you are here, and we can contact you, find out if there is a way that we can serve you here at Liberty Baptist Church. But um, a special welcome from us this morning. Today begins Operation Christmas Child Collection Week. As you can see, the boxes have started coming. Um, if you packed a box or you would like to pack a box, do not worry. There is still time. You can bring it um, to the ministry center this week, or you can even bring it with you next Sunday. Um, so bring your box if you haven't done so yet, because this is collection week. And before you leave today, you can pick this up. What this is... Um, is a daily prayer guide. So it's a little bookmark, and on the back is a way how you can specifically pray um, each day of the week, Sunday through next Saturday. It gives you specific ways to pray for the ministry as hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of boxes are being collected this week. So pick one up before you leave. Put it in your Bible. As you open your Bible each day, um, you can Read this and find out how you can specifically pray for the ministry this week. So that's a great way to continue um, participating in what the Lord is doing through Operation Christmas Child. Lastly, we need bell ringers at Kroger. If you have a smiling face and you would like to ring the bell for Salvation Army at Kroger, um, please sign up. You can stop by the church office today or you can call us sometime this week for um, just a short two-hour shift to ring the bell for Salvation Army at Kroger. And those are all our announcements today, so now let's join in worshiping together. Amen. It's wonderful to know that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. Let's stand together as we sing about Christ, our cornerstone. Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
we get the privilege of praying for the shoe boxes that will literally go around the world. And not only will children receive a box full of toys, but inside of this box, they will receive uh, information about the gospel. Uh, they'll be followed up by uh, the good personnel of Samaritan's Purse, uh, where those who receive Christ will then be followed up through a 12-week discipleship process. And so uh, this has the possibility, already has impacted the world, and only God knows what these boxes will do as they go around the world. So why don't we not pray for the boxes? Why don't we pray for the children uh, and the families that will be affected because of your gracious contribution? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you, as these shoe boxes will soon be sent around the world, God, we pray for the children who will receive them. Maybe uh, some of them, this will be the first time they ever receive a gift. And God, we pray that they wouldn't just receive this material gift, but God, that they would receive the greatest gift of all, and that is the gift of Jesus. And so we pray that you have already orchestrated people in this church and churches all over America to pack these boxes. And now as they literally go around the world, we pray that we would continue to hear reports of people not only receiving the boxes, but receiving you. God, we, we're thankful that you gave us your very self, that you went to a cross, you died for us, you've risen again so that we can have life. And God, we pray that the ultimate gift, the gift of Jesus, would be what was, would be ultimately received by these children and these families who receive these boxes. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Amen. We can love because he first loved us. Let's stand together just for us. again. We thank you that you brought us together. Be with those who were unable to attend this morning. Reach out to them and let us, let us be the ones that let them know they were missed, Lord. Continue to be in the lives of many in their community who've lost loved ones recently. Be with them as they grieve. We thank you for all that you do for us, Lord, and we're grateful. We hope that we'll represent an attitude of gratitude. Be with this offering this morning, Lord, that it may be used for your purposes of widening your kingdom both here and abroad. We ask you to be with the shoe boxes. They'll be collected today, Lord, that they will reach out to many who may not know you at all and be the first connection. We thank you for the blessings we enjoy, Lord. We thank you for the season that is one of thankfulness, and we ask that we exhibit that, Lord, not only this month, but in the oncoming year. I ask these things in your name, in your grace. Amen.
Well, today we conclude our series simply entitled, One Another, Christian Civility in a Cruel World. My prayer is that while the world around you may not desire to embrace civility or even Christian civility, my prayer is that you will. Christian civility is about deciding what type of person you want to be. It is about deciding what type of interactions you want to have. It is about deciding what type of contribution you want to make. And I do not think that Christians can say, well, I must engage in poor speech. I must engage in poor behavior because everybody else is doing it. Just because everybody else is doing it, you don't have to do it. Actually, this gives us a cultural moment to stand out. The Christian can still speak the truth, but can do so in love. The, the Christian can still fight for what is right, but do so in a non-aggressive, and God forbid we ever become violent, in a non-violent way to say, I'll, I'll stand for truth, I'll stand for what is right, but I'll do so in such a way that gives glory to God and bears witness to Christ. You know, the, the truth is still this truth, that even if we want to go for a righteous end, you have a righteous cause you want to argue for, the truth still stands that the, the means don't justify the end. You say, I'm doing something good, so I'll say and do whatever I need to say and do so I can get there. That's not the Christian way. The Christian way is to embody virtue both along the journey and once one arrives at the destination. I hope that you stop and think about the nature of your speech and interaction uh, as we conclude this series. Today we end with the simple phrase, love one another. There's no more appropriate end to uh, the one another series than the love one another. Uh, love is Christianity's highest virtue. I would propose that uh, the uh, America's highest virtue, we talked about liberty, but I would say that oftentimes, right there along with liberty, which we talked about over the summer, that people often confuse love with another virtue that Americans like, and that is tolerance. And actually, love is higher than tolerance. It's one thing for me to tolerate you. I'll tolerate you being around. I'll put up with you. Uh, you can be there. I'll be here. You stay out of my space. I'll stay out of your space. We'll tolerate one another. But love drives us deeper than toleration. Uh, love says not that you be there, I'll be here, I'll leave you alone, you leave me alone. Love says I want the best for you. A much higher virtue. The sad reality is when, when you ask Americans what do they mean by love, love is poorly defined and I would propose that with all the talk about love, very few people have a Christian definition of love. Uh, I would propose that for most Americans, love is a feeling it's an emotion, it's a sentiment. That's what it is. You say, what is love? It's a feeling. Because I hear people say, well, I fell in love. Uh, or I, unfortunately, fell out of love. The emotion came, the emotion went. So you've got kind of sentimental love over here. And then worse than that, we've taken this big word, love, and just made it trite. <laughs> Like, I love hot dogs. I mean, come on. Uh, you shouldn't even eat hot dogs. How in the world should you love them? And I know plenty of people eat hot dogs. Your cardiologist, I promise, has something to say about that. Uh, nevertheless, so you've got a sentimentality, and then you've got a triteness. Um, and basically, I want you to, I want to make sure you maybe know what the dominant culture says about love so we can contrast it with, with what Jesus says. Okay, so if love is just sentimentality, if it's just emotion, then this is the way it works. 
I'm, I'm just moving along in life. And then someone does something. You know, I hear people who say that they fell in love. They say, well, you know, he makes me laugh. Or she makes me feel important. Or he is so kind to me. Or she is so complimentary. So what happens, if just so you notice how this works, is that a person creates a set of conditions whereby you fall in love with them. Now don't you think that's what we think as a general culture? That someone creates a set of conditions and because of the set of conditions that this person has made, I fall in love. I don't, now just keep this in your mind because we're going to contrast it with Christian love. Now watch this. As soon as these set of conditions that this person has created so that I can fall in love with them stops, guess what happens? You fall out. Because you say, oh, you know, whoa. You know, uh, you know, you used to make me laugh, now you make me cry. You used to be compliment, complimentary, now you're quite rough with your words. You know, you used to be so kind, now I think you're mean. And so it's a set of conditions, and this is just sentiment. By the way, if you inspect this, this is so profoundly self-centered. I love you because what you can do for me. That's not love at all, by the way. That's just self-centeredness cloaked up in sentimentality with the wrong word on top of it. And if the world says all we need is love, this type of love won't get us much of anything. It will get us exactly what it's gotten us so far, and that is sentimentality as long as it lasts, emotions as long as they're felt, and as soon as they're over, they're over. Uh, I have to express to Couple, couples and people, that just because you use the word don't, doesn't mean you necessarily have the definition. And today I want to, to make sure that when we leave the message that we don't think love one another means having sentimental feelings towards people as long as those people meet a certain set of conditions that I need to make them, me feel this particular way. If that's what you think the love command of Jesus means, well, it doesn't. So I set that definition out. Now let's contrast it. What does Jesus mean when he pulls his disciples aside before his death and says, the highest command you will have for one another and for me is real and profound love. John chapter 13, verses 34 through 38. Uh, we're going to inspect this command of Jesus. The first major point today is this. <clears throat> to love one another, we must properly understand and receive the unconditional, sacrificial love of Christ. Verse 34, I only read the first part of this verse to get us started. Jesus speaking, a new command, I give you a new command, love one another just as I have loved you. So there's the, there's the verse. So how is it that Jesus says a new command? I thought we already had the command, love one another. So in what sense is the love command made new by Jesus. Uh, the old command was, if you followed it, the golden rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is not the highest Christian virtue. Uh, it, it's better to love your neighbor to the similar degree that you would love you rather than love your neighbor to the degree that you never treat yourself. So that that's... That's a very good moral principle, but that is not the ultimate love command in the New Testament. Here's the problem with the idea of love your neighbor as yourself. Here's the problem with it, is that plenty of people have an improper love of self. I, I meet these every day. 
Uh, they have poor self-worth. They're overrun by guilt. They have shame. They have remorse. They have sense of unworthiness and self-loathing. Believe it or not, I would propose that many people have a pretty poor relationship with their own selves. And so when they transfer that uh, to other people, it creates all manner of disruption. Uh, I often talk to children or teenagers of parents. They say, I think my mom's crazy. Uh, I think my dad's crazy. Why do they treat me like this? And I say, well, sometimes they treat you like that because that's how they treat themselves. That's how they view the world. And so this idea of love your neighbor as yourself, while an excellent moral principle as far as it stands, is not the love command of Jesus. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. Now, this requires not us first to give love, but to be the recipient of a new type of love. If I had to define the love of Jesus in two words, I would say his love is unconditional and his love is sacrificial. This is what I've learned is that so many people struggle to receive unconditional love. Let me show you how hard this is to even grasp. Um, what if today, I won't do this, but what if today I really made you air your dirty laundry? I mean really air your dirty laundry. We pull the skeletons out of the closet. Uh, we pull up your sins. We pull up your failures. We pull up your flaws. We pull up everything you've done this week that you're not proud of. Then we just set it right out here in, in front of God and everybody else. The sense that I think every one of us would feel at that moment is shame, guilt, or not being the type of person we ought to be. But it is exactly in that moment, it is exactly in that state, that once all the stuff is out, that you really can finally and maybe for the first time understand a love apart from conditions. Because here's a lot of conditions that should point in the opposite way, but now they are pointing the, God says, in spite of all of this, I love you anyway. Now, if you can get the contrast, the reason most people love someone else is because the set of conditions, right, that the, the other person creates. This makes it so hard for people to understand the love of God. The love of God, listen carefully, God does not look at us and say, well, what can you do for me? Can you warm my heart? Can you make me laugh? Can you throw me a compliment? Why does God love us? This is so hard for some people to grasp. God loves us because He is loving. That's why He loves us. God needs nothing from us to move His love. God is moved to love in and from Himself. What could be more radical than a, what could be more radical than this type of love versus the sentimental love that we call love? To say that I am moved from myself. I am moved within myself, not because of the recipient, but because of the lover. No conditions. And not only is the love of God unconditional, the love of God is sacrificial. Listen, you love someone who possesses no quality that would move you to love. You know what most people do when you love them and they don't possess a set of conditions that make them lovable? When you start loving them, what do they do? Resist you. 
That's exactly what we do to God. God loves us because, well, He's loving, not because we're lovable. And God says, and my love is so strong, my love is so apart from conditions, that no obstacle that you put to me that would hinder my love for you will stop me from loving you. And thus the story of Christianity. That God said, sin won't stop my love. Death won't stop my love. Your resistance won't stop my love. I will love you any way. And I will just say, true Christian embodiment of love is not first giving that, but first receiving that. To say, God, you as a lover loved me not because of something I did, but because of someone you are. And you let no condition stop you. My resistance, my sin, my, my hesitation, you let no condition stop you from loving me. And God says, yes, this is the message of the gospel. And he says, until you receive this type of love, you know, you weren't, you weren't the one who possessed this. You're the one who didn't possess this, and God in His grace gave it to you anyway. And, and what a radically different vision of love that is. My question is today, do you realize that you were an enemy of God? Do you realize that you were the one resistant? Do you realize you were the one who gave God no conditions of something that you did to make him love you, but God, because he is the embodiment of true and genuine love, loved you in spite of yourself and let no obstacle stop his love. Jesus says, a new command I give you. By the way, that is a lot different than love your neighbor as yourself. Don't you think? <laughs> I mean, do you have a new command I give you? Love one another just as I have loved you. The ultimate paradigm of love. Now notice my second point. It says to love one another we must not just get, receive it, but we must give the unconditional sacrificial love of Christ which will be an unmistakable witness to others. Verse 34, the second part, just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So the question is, why do we love other Christians? Do we love other Christians because they make us laugh? Do we love other Christians because they compliment us? Do, they, do we love other Christians because they're really good church members? Do we love other Christians because they have great, impeccable Christian character? No, we love other Christians because we have been loved by Christ and that type of love must flow out of us. I've heard the endless stories. People say, I can't love all these church people. They're crazy. You know, they, they hurt me. They, they've done bad things to me. Um, they've said harsh words. They've done mean gestures. So I can't love them anymore. What type of love are we talking about? Oh, the old sentimental type of love, right? A set of conditions have to be met for me to love. As soon as those set of conditions are gone, my love ceases. But that's not the love Jesus says that we give for one another. Love one another just as I have loved you. Think about how radically different the Christian experience is, if you walk in the doors on Sunday morning and you say, I'm just going to choose to love these people because God just chose to love me. I'm just going to love them with their flaws and their faults and their problems. You know why? Because God loved me with my flaws and my faults and my problems. And I'm not going to let any obstacle that they may manufacture my love for them. Can you imagine how radically different 
that tenacious type of love embodied in God's church, that type of love, that type of witness, Jesus said the world is going to have no problem identifying who's his and who's everybody else. My sad, my, 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 my gr grievous um, concern here is that the type of love that can often be embodied in the church is the same old tired sentimentality that is destroying, destroying God's world. To walk into a room, to walk in among Christians and say, you are my brother and sister in Christ, and I'm going to love you apart from conditions. And I'm going to love you, if need be, sacrificially. And I'm not going to let any mean thing you do stop me from loving you. That's exactly the way Jesus loved us. You know, the, you know what's so wonderful about this? Oftentimes when we love people in that way, that does form the basis of people actually loving back. Because it was the tenacious love of Christ that when we saw, God's not going to stop, is he? He's just going to keep coming back. He's going to keep loving. He's going to keep offering. He's going to keep asking. If he's really this serious about loving me, I'm going to love him. And deep and profound communion can happen. I think you get this point, don't you? But... I'm going, to, I'm going to look at my third point. Just how radically would our life be if love was not contingent upon the other, but love was just the expression of something that comes out of me. That I choose to be. You know, Christian civility is about choosing to be a certain type of person. I think most people think, I'll love those who love me means I love those who, who meet a certain set of conditions. And those who don't love me, I don't love them. And that's no love at all. Self-centeredness. It's self-serving. But to say, I want to be a loving person. And I want to love people. And I don't care what people do. And I don't care what people say. I want to be. You understand how different that? I want to be a loving person. And God has loved me sacrificially. And God has loved me apart from conditions. And so I will love apart from conditions and sacrificially if need be. Now, <laughs> what do we do after this? Well, you say, how do I know that I've gotten here? I mean, you understand it. I hope you understand it. If not, you'll have to re-watch the video. Because I've done about as much explaining as I can do. But how do you know? How do you know that you've embodied this type of love? Well, I think after Jesus teaches, Simon Peter says, I got it. He says, I can do this. I, I can do this. I get it. Love one another as, as you have. I can do this. I got it. Well, now notice the third point. To love one another, we must demonstrate Christ's love through our action and not in mere sentiment. We can say we're going to do it, but you know when we know we're doing it? When we've done it. That's when we know we've done it. Here it is, verse 36. Lord, Simon Peter said to him, Where are you going? Jesus answered. Uh, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Lord, Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Simon Peter says, I've got it. I've got this type of love. Jesus replied, will you lay down your life for me? I assure you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. I read another passage. To just show you Peter's love journey. John 21, 15 through 19, the end of the Gospel of John, it says, And when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love 
me more than these. Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep. He told me, uh, he told him, he asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know everything. You know that, that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. I assure you, when you were young, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to signify by what kind of death he would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. You know, this two, these two interchanges with Simon Peter and Jesus. One, Simon Peter being so sure that he had it and then denying Jesus. And then post Jesus' resurrection to have this restoration, Simon Peter is learning how to love. You say, well, what is Simon Peter's problem? Well, Simon Peter had chosen to love Jesus, there's no doubt. But Simon Peter still had a condition on how he was going to love Jesus. Because Simon Peter was hoping that if it went down with Jesus, he would go down with Jesus. Several years ago, I went to San Antonio, Texas. I was there at a, at a Christian conference. But some, when you're in San Antonio, you got to get out of the Bible conference long enough to go down to the Alamo. You know, you got to you got to go down and see where David Crockett met his end. And quite frankly, the Alamo was pretty pathetic. No wonder they all died. It wasn't big enough to stand behind. Uh, looks like they should have gone on <laughs> down the road a little bit and found something a little bigger to stand behind. No wonder they didn't make it. But this was Simon Peter's vision. Simon Peter thought, man, when they come, Jesus is going to grab his sword, and I'm going to grab our sword, and we're going to say, remember the Alamo, and we're coming after them. But when Jesus said, Simon, put your sword down, he says, I'm just going to walk on in and turn myself in. Simon Peter wasn't ready for that. He wasn't ready for that level of sacrifice. He wasn't ready for that level of turning over. Simon Peter was ready, I think, to go down in the gun battle. He could have gone, you know, he could have gone down in a big way. But when Jesus flipped the script on him and went in a way that he couldn't, Simon Peter, having a condition of how he was going to live his, lay down his life for Jesus, checked out. He says he denied the Lord. Because Simon Peter, to the very end, didn't want Jesus to, to die and thought if he did, we, we would go down strong. And when Jesus said, look, Simon Peter, I'm just going to go lay down my life, he couldn't embrace it. I would just say that uh, the restoration of Simon Peter certainly should, should, should caution all of us to think that we embody the love that Jesus has given for us. Because after the resurrection... Jesus appears to Simon Peter in a move of restoration and asks him three times, do you love me? No doubt to mirror the three denials of Jesus, or three denials of Simon Peter by Jesus. Do you love me? Do you love me? And Simon Peter is saying, Jesus, only you know if I love you. You say, well, how do we know that we love in this way. And I would just end with this simple, this simple test. That real love, sacrificial love, requires demonstration. And you can say, well, I, well no, I love people without condition. Okay. Who has given you a set of conditions that were unloving and you continue to love them anyway. 
Who put up resistance to your love? And rather than check out, you leaned in. Can you imagine the healing that would have happened to God's church if this type of love, a sacrificial demonstration of love, was given to Christians? There would rarely be church splits. There would rarely be prolonged church fights. Because, you, because people would say, I have cho chosen to love as Christ has loved me. And there's nothing you're going to do to stop me becoming a loving person. I don't need your conditions to lean in to real love. You just say, how do I know if I gotten there? Who has given you so, a very good reason not to, and you still chose to? There you know that you're actually giving the type of love that Christ has given to us. My final appeal to you today is, have you received the love of God that he has for you? You say, well, I'm so unlovable. God doesn't love you based on you. He loves you based on himself. God is loving and he wants you to become, you already are an object of his love. He's already decided, I love you, not because of who you are, I'm willing to love you in spite of who you are. And some of you today aren't Christians. There's never been a time, never been a place where you've chosen to become a Christian. Why not today come to a cross and receive the love of God? And then for those of us who are Christians, I really, as you leave this series, think about, have I embraced a, sentiment, a, a sentimental or trite version of love that has nothing, almost nothing to do with the self-giving love of God, the unconditional love of God. And just the difference is this. You don't walk around going, well, who's out there loving enough for me to love? That's what the world does. Who's out there loving enough for me to love? You look okay. Uh, not, not this group. No, you look okay. You know, no, 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 over. That's the way the world works. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world. He says, I'm not looking for who's lovable. I just am loving. And so my love is not contingent upon you. It's contingent upon me. And so may us Christians hear the words of Jesus and live them out faithfully. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you. That you, would, that you would help us to embody this, this type of love. We, we with Simon Peter, uh, no doubt, are, are humbled to even think about, even if we think we have this, God, we, conditions can come that make us not want to be loving. And so, God, may you so impress upon us the love you have for us that that love emanates from us into the world. May we not look for ones who are loving. May we ourselves become loving. God, whoever you bring in our path, these will be those who will be objects of your love through us. God, I pray for our church that we would love one another just as you have loved us, and the world may know that we are your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.